Good morning, afternoon, evening, or whatever it is, wherever you are. I am the queer, Christian, anarcho-communist, and this is a YouTube special, bringing my channel back. In this show, I have an extended conversation with solar punk anarchist about anarchism, Marxism, and the history and practice of anarchist theory. Now, I thoroughly enjoyed this discussion, and I hope you do as well. If the good Lord wills, we will have more conversations in the future on a wide variety of topics, including the relationship, antagonistic and otherwise, between anarchism, communism, and religion. Now, before I begin this recording, uh, uh, the recording of our discussion, I want to note that this is not an endorsement by either of us of the other's politics. This is solely a conversation between comrades. All that being said, I learned a great deal from this discussion, and I hope you do too. So without further ado, please enjoy my conversation about anarchism with Solarpunk Anarchist. Okay, so uh, I got my notes here, got my coffee, you got your coffee, uh, where do we begin? Well, uh, I'm going to pull up my, my notes. I'd like to begin with, like, for some of the, you know, I'm, I have considered myself an anarchist for a very long time. It's a political ideology that has recently become very, uh, big, you know, there's been sort of a resurgence of what's usually called the left um, ever since the election of, of Donald Trump uh, with between the Bernie Sanders campaign in the United States, the Jeremy Corbyn campaign in the United Kingdom, and similar movements have been happening for a few years now. And I would be uh, a lot of people have begun calling themselves uh, leftists, Marxists, anarchists, socialists. And these words, uh, the, these, these movements, have a very long history. And my impression is that a lot of people don't really seem to get even the basics, or so to use these terms almost interchangeably. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you... If, our, for our discussion today, I want to sort of dig into anarchism specifically so that people maybe can who listen to this can have a better understanding, whether they're anarchists or not, and a deeper appreciation of its significance and it, it's how it's distinct from uh, these other movements that are usually sort of grouped into on the left, um, mm -hmm. at least in popular discourse. So... If we could just begin, uh, before we dig into specifics, if you could just sort of comment on, very briefly, the sort of the history of, of even just this term, the left, and why these were these very distinct um, and even uh, mutually uh, incompatible, in some ways, ideologies sort of get thrown together, um, and why you think people are... Use, using these terms almost uh, as synonyms these days. Uh, yeah, well, uh, apparently the entire history of the term the left uh, and its uh, equivalent in various other languages uh, is quite arbitrary. It first emerged in the early 1800s in the French Parliament, I think in and around the 1820s or 1830s, and it was used uh, as a term for pretty much anyone who was against the reestablishment of the old ways of things, the monarchy, the nobility, uh, <clears throat> the ancien regime, and uh, or even people who didn't necessarily want to, uh, to reestablish it, but uh, set up some kind of a system that was in that same vein. Pretty much anyone who was against that 
sat in the left wing of the French Parliament, anyone who was for the re-establishment of the old order in some form or another sat in the right wing. So you had, even back then, uh, different factions that had nothing whatsoever to do with one another uh, sat in the left wing, and and conversely, people who had nothing to do with each other sat in the right wing. Uh, so it was both terms, left wing and right wing, first emerged when when they first emerged, they had less to do with what they were for and more what they were against. What they were for emerged more organically through the process of opposing what they were against. And uh, like on the left wing, you had people like uh, Pierre Joseph Proudhon, who was a radical socialist. Uh, and also on the left wing, you had uh, Frederick Bastiat. Uh, I think that's how you pronounce his name. I'm I'm terrible with French words, so I apologize for any. French speakers, if I'm mispronouncing that, who was a free market fundamentalist. Uh, he'd nowadays be called a libertarian in the American sense of the word. Uh, they both sat in the left wing, and yet they had diametrically opposed political beliefs and uh, warred with each other furiously in a series of letters, which uh, have since been published and you can read online and are quite quite amusing as they start civil and uh, then uh, generally go on to stating vicious insults at one another. But uh, yeah, throughout the 19th century, then, it came to refer to everyone from liberals in the sense of classical liberals, uh, free marketeers, socialists, communists, trade unionists, mutualists, and anarchists. Uh, basically, anyone who was against the way things used to be was considered a left-winger or later a leftist, although the term leftist itself uh, doesn't seem to exist until the early 1900s. Uh, I think the first recorded use of it in a dictionary was around 1910, 1911, something like that. Uh, so, yeah, it's, uh, I guess if you were to define left-wing and right-wing as a whole, you could say that, again, very, like, lowest common denominator meaning is People who are left-wing have a general commitment to egalitarianism. They think egalitarianism in some form or another is a good thing, and people who define themselves as right-wing think it's a bad thing. Uh, again, in general, that's... Uh, you can't really get any more specific than that. Those are very general definitions, but you can't define them any more specifically than that without excluding people who do, in fact, class themselves as left-wing. If you class it as opposition to the state, you exclude state socialists. If you uh, define it as being pro-state, you exclude anarchists. So the closest you can get to a coherent uh, summation of what being a leftist means is you think equality in some form or other is good, whether that be equality before the law, economic equality without uh, cultural or political equality, or all kinds of equality, which I would define anarchism as, uh, that in general is uh, what you could class as being left-wing. And uh, I think we err a great deal when we try to make the left, quote-unquote, into this big kind of abstraction, this big team that we're all supposedly a part of. Uh, because really, it's not a single thing. It's a very loose category of different things, which are all united by something general, but they're probably, when you look at the big picture, divided against each other more than they are united. They're united against anyone who's on the right wing, but they're, they don't necessarily have anything in common. It's kind of like herding cats together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it definitely seems that, um, you know, certainly for, for anarchists, uh, you know, the this term the left, at least speaking for myself, sort of ends up grouping me in with people who I have uh, very little, if anything, to do with. And obviously sometimes, you know, you, if you're working at unionizing, you know, uh, or, or an organization campaign in the workplace, you make these sort of tactical alliances with people that are there or that are working with you. If you're doing anti-fascist action, 
Um, you know, you make or trying to things. organize for refugee solidarity yeah. or uh, ecological defense, whatever it may be. Yeah, you end up uh, working with people who you're at least on that issue on the same side as, but not all of the people who you'll be working alongside on any given issue will even think of themselves necessarily as leftists. Like Dave Foreman, for instance, uh, was uh, the founder of, uh, one of the founders at least, of uh, Earth First. And he uh, regularly got down in front of bulldozers, tried to prevent uh, trees from getting ripped up, uh, forests from getting cut down, and... Uh, he said he got really upset when everyone would accuse him of being a communist. He kept saying, guys, I'm a registered Republican. I am a conservative. I'm a political conservative. And it's because I'm a conservative, I believe in conserving the environment. So, yeah, so you had this guy was working alongside socialists and anarchists, but uh, and they were at least on that issue united, but they weren't all necessarily leftists. So, uh Maybe contextually speaking, you could say he was doing leftist things, but then that just gets further down into the uh, definition wobble as to uh, who is and who isn't uh, part of the category. Yeah, and in particular with, this is probably more of it, at least in my experience, a thing online than it is an actual uh, activist or movement circle. So the sort of meme, I guess, of quote-unquote, left unity, to me, it's calling for some sort of unity between anarchists who are opposed to both the state and to capitalism with Marxist-Leninists and, and Stalinists. That's about mm. as much sense as a, quote-unquote, libertarian unity with between uh, a anarchists uh, and the American libertarians or, you know, Ayn, Ayn Rand style so-called ancap and anarchist capitalists that's right and uh i i have in fact encountered many an ncap many a right-wing capitalist libertarian who does in fact uh want that kind of libertarian unity unity of anti-statists unity of all those who think government is a bad idea who i have had almost word for word the exact same conversations with self-described anarcho-capitalists as i have had with uh Marxist-Leninists over the issue of uh, who anarchists should be on the side of. Uh, and yeah, I guess, it, and again, on single issues, we may wind up on the same side fighting for the same things, even if we're just, if it's just a case of being against some of the same things, we're going to end up uh, marching together or part of the same campaign together, uh, whatever, on whatever it may be. But when, when there's this talk of unity, in particular, this meme of left unity, it's usually something a lot deeper than the short-term, temporary, tactical unity that and that must happen at some point or another if you're going to get anything done. I mean, I think whether or not that's even necessary, I think it's inevitable that that will end up happening. And uh, I figure, you know, why fight it? Uh, Maybe with some exceptions, like don't work with anybody who's actually waving a flag of Joseph Stalin around. That's probably a bad look and it's probably going to hurt you. But uh, yeah, you're pro like I've marched along like I live in Ireland. I've marched uh, alongside people who consider themselves Trotskyists, uh, Maoists. Uh, not I don't think I've ever in real life face to face actually met a Stalinist, but uh, I guess maybe they were there i don't know but uh they they seem to have really come out of the woodwork in the last five or so years uh for whatever reason but uh yeah i wh when when they demand this left unity it's something deeper than that temporary tactical unity it's a deeper kind of ideological unity where we should all be singing from the same hymn sheet we should all think of ourselves as being part of the same team, even if we wear different colors uh, from time to time. And in practice, uh, all rhetoric aside, in practice, what that tends to boil down to is Marxist-Leninists uh, leading the charge and anarchists doing whatever, they, doing whatever uh, they're told. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. always this asymmetric... Uh, 
unity in which Marxists are allowed to call anarchists uh, petty bourgeois idealists and liberals, uh, but anarchists aren't allowed to say anything about Marxist-Leninists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it seems to, to me at least that in many ways the of, of these the, the different groups that sometimes get bundled onto the left rhetorically, the ones that the anarchists are closest to, um, at least in terms of the sorts of values that, that we at least claim to hold, would be uh, sort of social democrats and the more progressive liberals, um, more than in, in some ways than either the the ANCAPs or the, the Leninists. Mm. I think on a majority of issues, yes, I, I guess... There may be one or two I issues. No, I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to push that too far necessarily. But oh, me neither. Yeah, uh, I think there are maybe a couple of issues in which on which anarchists are closer than your average social democrat. Uh, so, sorry, let me start that sentence again. There are certain issues on which uh, anarchists may be closer to, say, Leninists than they are to social democrats. Uh, like single issues, like maybe imperialism. Uh, you might have a social democrat who's soft on imperialism and a leninist who's hard on it and anarchists would be closer to leninists on that issue you might have social democrats who support the nordic model of criminalizing sex work and right-wing libertarians who are against that who support decriminalization anarchists would be closer to libertarian capitalists on that issue but yeah in broad strokes i think on a majority of issues ideologically at least uh Anar social anarchists, at least, are, are probably closest to the left wing of social democracy as far as mainstream politics goes, yeah. Yeah, and it, this sort of gets into some of the historical questions I wanted to ask about, um, because it seems like the, there are, and people like Chomsky uh, have, have made this point, in the during the Enlightenment period, as you go through the development of of actual classical liberalism as opposed to the uh, Jordan Peterson style, <laughs> quote unquote, classical liberalism, you have these sort of impulses around the importance of freedom and, and, and democracy that uh, sort of form the historical intellectual milieu out of which uh, anarchism and uh, modern liberalism emerge as well as some of these other movements but uh, what, what even Trump's socialism is, yeah even, yeah even early socialism you could say is an outgrowth is an outgrowth of the radical wing specifically of classical liberalism and again this is a term that was used incredibly broadly in the late 1700s and early 1800s uh, pretty much anyone who was in any way forward thinking was classed uh, either at the time or retrospectively as either a radical or a liberal or a radical liberal. And out of that general milieu, that uh, structure of feeling emerged all the various socialisms. You get Robert Owen, Saint-Simon, Charles Fourier. Uh, uh, all of these thinkers were part of that same environment of thought that was going on at the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, the, but we the first... we now like we now uh, have this uh, situation in which we have this ironclad distinction between what's called liberalism and socialism, or liberalism and leftism, and uh, to an extent that makes sense. To to the extent that liberal is used as a synonym for a centrist or a moderate or a supporter of the status quo, that distinction does make sense. But historically speaking, it's a lot more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you, well, you have these, um, the, the first person I believe who used the term anarchist was, of course, uh, Proudhon, um, but it, it, he, he and his work comes out of a whole tradition of political economy, and it goes back to, um, you had, everybody knows, you know, Adam Smith, David Ricardo, we have Hodgkins, and then Proudhon does mm -hmm. his work, uh, De Jacques, I believe, is, is, is the one who criticizes Dawn, um, and then Marx and Engels uh, emerge there too. Um, and then sort of you have the, the conflict between the anarchists and the Marxists um, in the first international and then the, the dialogue between Marx and Proudhon. I wonder if you could just talk about the, 
that conflict and how Marx on the one hand uh, and, and Engels and then on the other, Proudhon, Bakunin, um, and, and those that followed them, uh, how they diverged on the, these, the questions of, of political economy. Okay, uh, first on the issue of political economy, <clears throat> yeah, you're right, they were all drawing from the same pool of ideas of classical political economy uh, that goes back to Adam Smith, uh, David Ricardo, and uh, a few others that uh, scarcely get a mention nowadays. But yes, they were taking the ideas developed within classical political economy and turning them towards radical ends, in many ways uh, t consciously twisting the assumptions of the classicals and uh, the political economists, as they were called at the time, and showing that actually, if you take this idea to its logical conclusion, it brings you to a socialistic slash communistic uh, solution to this issue you're talking about. And uh, yeah, uh, everyone forgets uh, William Thompson as well, an Irishman who uh, he was mm -hmm. part of the uh, Robert Owen's uh, cooperative movement. He actually wrote several books uh, which criticized capitalism uh, in the 1820s and 1830s uh, from both an ethical perspective and an economic uh, perspective, uh, the first of which is called The Distribution of Wealth. Well, that's the shortened version of the title. The actual title is about a whole paragraph long, as many uh, yeah. tracts of the day were. But uh, yeah, yeah. One, of those, one of those old books with the uh, you know, entire title page worth of title. <laughs> Yeah, like uh, an inquiry concerning political economy and the effects it has on something, something, something. Yeah, but uh, yeah. yeah, that that book, uh, his work actually anticipates the. Uh, it, it's mostly ignored nowadays, and in fact, I was only able to find it uh, on uh, I think Gutenberg uh, Library in, in this old PDF copy that uh, of a book that of a physical copy that was itself about a hundred years old, but. Uh, so it's very difficult to track down. But if you read it, it's, it anticipates many of the same ideas that you find later in the 1840s in Proudhon, in the 1850s and 60s with Marx and with all of the other uh, what were later called Ricardian socialists and uh, socialist uh, economists of, of the 1800s. Yeah, but uh, in, in terms of more famous figures and in terms of what was going on in the uh, European continent, yes, uh, Proudhon in the early 1840s wrote two books, uh, the first of which being What is Property, in which he uses this very Enlightenment-centric uh, uh, logical process to debunk the institution of private property, which at first uh, Karl Marx, uh, the young Karl Marx who was a journalist at the time, was deeply inspired by and uh, recommended to people. And then later, a uh, system of economic contradictions, subtitled Or the Philosophy of Poverty, which uh, is a more general critique of capitalism as a system. The system of economic contradictions of the title is capitalism, although that term wasn't yet used uh, to describe the system as a whole. It was, as far as I'm aware, only used to describe uh, finance. But uh, that's another issue. And uh, Marx hated this book at the time, so much so that he wrote a 150-page book dis, uh, dismembering it. Uh, and uh, this is funny because uh, Proudhon himself uh, got a copy and uh, scribbled various things in the margin. And we have those scribblings today in which uh, Proudhon read this book and was like, what the hell is this guy on? Like, he says, I, I say this thing when I say the opposite. He makes up entire uh, ideas, then attributes them to me. He attributes the ideas of others to me when I said I oppose them. And uh, in a letter to somebody else, uh, Proudhon said, for some weird reason, Karl Marx seems ashamed that we think so alike. And Marx himself, in later works like A Contribution to the Critique of Political Economy and in Capital Volume 1, he adopts many of the same ideas and techniques as Proudhon in system of economic contradictions, despite lambasting it. So it's, yeah, they, they were, not only were they pulling from the same pool of ideas, they came to many of the same conclusions. Uh, 
such as using a hypothetical deductive method to take capitalism apart and try to figure out how it works, kind of like taking a clock apart. Uh, but it's Marx and Capital Volume 1 we remember, rather than Proudhon's two major contributions to the field. Uh, what is property first and system of economic contradictions uh, second? But uh, anyway, uh, Marx's Capital Volume 1 is what became enshrined in history as the socialist critique of political economy. But because almost nobody nowadays, and uh, even since the beginning of the 20th century, ever bothers to read any of these other socialist critics or leftist critics of political economy, uh, critics of capitalism, Capital Volume 1 and the other two volumes, and Marx's oeuvre in general, starts to seem a lot more novel than it really was at the time. At the time, it was merely regarded as the best then available critique of uh, capitalism, the best encapsulation of the overall socialist critique of capitalism that had been in development for decades and had been the work of generations of socialist and leftist thinkers, including Proudhon, including Thompson, including Hodgkin. And, uh, uh, but because nobody bothers to read their work nowadays, Capital Volume 1 seems to arise out of the ether, or rather arise entirely out of the brain of Karl Marx alone, when in reality, most of the ideas contained within it were neither original nor unique to him. Uh, to a large extent, it's more a synthesis of the ideas of previous thinkers than it is a wholly original work. Yeah, it, it certainly, that, that certainly has been my impression. I suppose that the reason why Marx himself, his work at least, has become so prominent, I would guess, is because of the, um, the success of the Bolshevik uh, revolution and, right. the, and the work of the Marx Engels Institute in Moscow in mm. publishing and promoting his work. They had far greater resources to spread the, I guess you could say, the legend of Marx and Engels that he was a kind of prophet. Whereas if you look at the situation, the uh, state of the anti-capitalist movement in the late 1800s and the early 20th century, it Marxism wasn't as popular as is commonly believed. It was popular in industrializing uh, European nations like Germany and, uh, to a lesser extent, Britain, but uh, it didn't catch on that much in the United States. It didn't catch on that much in uh, Italy or Spain uh, or Eastern Europe. Uh, anarchism and syndicalism tended to predominate in those nations. Uh, Nations which nowadays, uh, in world systems theory, uh, there's a specific term for them, semi-periphery. Uh, Marxism tended to dominate in industrializing nations, and anarchism and syndicalism tended to dominate uh, everywhere else. I mean, even Marxist historians like Eric Hobsbawm, for instance, admitted that prior to World War I, uh, 1914, uh, the majority of the left and socialist movement worldwide was anarchist and syndicalist rather than Marxist. It's only with the Bolshevik Revolution that Marxism establishes itself in one of in the largest country in the world, and thus uh, acquires a much greater prominence within uh, leftism as a worldwide movement. It starts to take the place of anarchism and syndicalism, which were kind of a package deal at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and during this this period, so like we were speaking of, of Italy, um, I'm I'm thinking of the Marx and Bakunin had obviously ha famously in the International Working Men's Association uh, were at constant constantly at loggerheads, um, but mm. there were, as I recall, um, during Marx's lifetime and then afterwards. Uh, very strident and very well done anarchist critiques of his writing um, and of Engels as well. Although the sometimes the I suppose the distinction between Marx and Engels gets lost these days. 
partly yeah, through, it can uh, get a bit blurry, through, yeah. Partly through Engel's own efforts, I, I, I believe. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Uh, as far as Engel's work was concerned, he was, uh, after Marx died, he was uh, Marx's uh, medium from the spirit world, uh, divining all of his uh, ideas and popularizing them to a wider audience. Yeah, he was the uh, St. Paul of Marxism, if you will. <laughs> I suppose the question to me then in thinking about Marxism as such is how much of it uh, is has more to do with his interpreters, Engels, and then later Lenin than it does with... Yeah, good point. Marx it's, it's, I think it's no, a lot like Christianity in that you can read any part of his oeuvre and come up with a... Marxism for that uh, that you can back up with textual evidence and say this is the the quote unquote real Marx. Uh, I don't think there really is a real Marx. Uh, like I'm often told by Marxists, uh, like forget about Marxism. Like just read Marx himself. Read the real Marx. Like uh, forget about all the interpretation. But I don't think there really is such a thing as the real Marx because for two reasons. One he was a human being. He changed his mind throughout his life. Like you can, like the Marx that was writing in the 1870s wasn't the same Karl Marx that was writing in the 1840s. So yeah, again, most people change their minds throughout their lives and you can freeze any point of his uh, writing and say, this is representative of the quote unquote real Marx, but I'm, I'm not convinced you can, you, you can really do that. And uh, two, uh, his work is often written in a very vague, difficult to pin down style where you can draw okay. multiple interpretations from it. So you have the fact he changed his mind throughout his life combined with the fact that so much of his text is, uh, lends itself to more than one interpretation so that before long you end up getting into hermeneutics and pretty much anyone can read Marx and come with a Marxism that makes sense to them, and many have. I mean, that's why there's... Has any, I wonder, has anyone ever done a formal taxonomy of each and every different hyphenated ism that it falls within the wider rubric of, of Marxism? You have Kautskyism, Leninism, Stalinism, Maoism, Trotskyism, Posadism, Luxembourgism, Council Communism, uh, Autonomism. Uh, I mean, I could go on. Yeah, yeah, and even within those, there are so many different little subdivisions, um, and it, it it really is amazing. The comparison to Christianity is is interesting because of the, my background is in in religious studies and theology, and yeah, it is the amount of the proliferation of sects uh, from this one person or this one very long and, and convoluted set of documents. Um, associated with this one person is, is kind of astounding, ranging from you have the council communists and autonomists, which in some, if, if you don't look too closely, are almost indistinguishable in some ways from certain kinds of anarchism. Mm, uh, that's right, through, yeah. Through Marxism, humanism, down to the uh, uh, totalitarian nightmares of, of Stalinism and, and the Maoism and the Cultural Revolution. Um, and yeah, it, it, uh, if you look at the rise of Christianity and you had different sects arguing whether Jesus had one nature that was both human and divine or two natures, one human, one divine, uh, Marxism starts to look a little like that when you see, uh, like, for example, if you look at Britain in the 1980s, you, uh, had all these different, uh, not even Marxist sects, Trotskyist sects, all furious at each other because they, like, took a slightly different position on one issue. And you would start with one party, it would uh, split into three, it would split into five, it would split into seven. It, it just got, it, it started to become almost like a real-life version of Monty Python's The Life of Brian, where you have the popular front of Judea, the people's front of Judea, the Judean people's front. <laughs> it, it, yeah. It becomes self-parody. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and these are these are the people talking to us about left unity. Yeah, it is. It really is uh, almost 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 a self-parody. Um, but to 
sort of circling back to the point, um, the in the early conflicts um, between Marxism, at least in its early you know, pre-Bolshevik era, um, yeah, yeah. did have uh, people m- making very strident critiques of Marxism. Um, I know you had uh, Malatesta, Kropotkin as well, I, th- I believe. Uh, Elisee Reclou, uh, Emma Goldman, yeah. Mm-hmm. I wonder if you could talk about some of the what those early uh, critiques and sort of that intera- early interaction was. So no, that well, I'm, I, I'm particularly interested. I believe I've seen you say some things on Twitter about Kropotkin's critiques of so-called um, historical or mati- dialectical materialism as being unscientific. That's right. And that, I, that was, also important to note that both of those terms, historical materialism and dialectical materialism, Marx himself not, didn't use either one. Both of those are uh, coinages. Uh, I think, I believe historical materialism was coined by Engels uh, to describe what Marx called the materialist conception of history. That was his preferred term. Historical materialism was more of a an academic term that I believe Engels came up with. And uh, dialectical materialism was the coinage of this other guy who's, uh, I can never remember his name. He ended up coming up with a, he was a tanner, I believe, a self-taught tanner who uh, came up with a philosophy that was almost identical to what Marx and Engels had developed independently of them, and then later joined their movement. But uh, yeah, later on with uh, Kautsky, uh, Karl Kautsky, the, who at one point in the 1890s was referred to as the Pope of Marxism, the primary theorist of Marxian social democracy, back when I should, uh, nowadays Marxism is almost synonymous with Bolshevism, with Leninism, but in the 1880s, 90s, and 1900s, uh, Marxism and German social democracy were basically synonymous. They were considered to be the same thing. Uh, to be a Marxist meant to be a social democrat. Uh, to want to uh, conquer state power through parliamentary means uh, as a means of uh, establishing socialism that way. But uh, sorry, I'm getting sidetracked. Uh, Yeah, uh, early critiques of that whole line of thinking, well, you could go back as early as Bakunin, who uh, I believe in Statism and Anarchy uh, provides one of the early robust critiques of the Marxist theory of the state as being nothing more than the executive committee of the ruling economic class. Uh, Marx uh, and Engels didn't think the state as an institution had an autonomy and will all of its own. They believed it was merely the instrument of whichever class was the most economically dominant. Uh, Bakunin, on the other hand, felt this was naive. He felt that uh, you, I think he, I'm paraphrasing here, but he said something along the lines of, uh, put the most radical socialist on the Tsar's throne, and within a year he'll be worse than the Tsar himself. Uh, Bakunin's view, and what later became the more established uh, social anarchist view, was that the state has a logic all of its own that can't just be reduced to the economic dimension. It It's more than just the interests of the ruling economic class made into politics and the political and the economic don't necessarily see eye to eye the entire time. And uh, with uh, Kropotkin, you have some of the earliest critiques of, again, the the thing though is that uh, it's important to mention Kropotkin rarely even talked about Marx. Uh, You see only scattered uh, mentions of him in his writings in the 1880s and 1890s, uh, and he usually just mentions him in passing when referring to various historical socialists, and uh, when he does mention him, it's usually to criticize something he believed in. Like, for example, when he's outlining his uh, view of uh, his critique of uh, paying people according to their contributions, uh, which at the time was the mainstream anarchist position, is that 
you should uh each person should be paid according to how much they contribute uh he said that uh, it, you can't really do this in a fair way because when you look at the big picture uh it's difficult to separate how much someone contributes uh versus another like yes you might have uh hammered that nail hammered nails into that building for 8 hours a day but the nails were made by somebody else and the metal was uh smelted by somebody else and so it's all interconnected to the point that it's difficult to se uh, separate one person's contribution from another and uh this formed part of uh his view of why the labor theory of value was mistaken uh he didn't believe that you could quantify the value of something by how much labor went into producing it some would say that's a based on a straw man uh characterization of the labor theory of value and of uh, marxian economics but at the same time it's also if that's a straw man it's also a straw man that's believed by a great deal of marxists themselves you could say that more nuanced and more subtle theorists of marxism uh view it a bit more carefully than that but uh at the very least it serves as an adequate i feel critique of the mainstream or at least the mainstream at the time and uh also in terms of historical materialism uh which is the view that it is the relations of production that uh drive human social development forward uh marx uh, not marx uh, kropotkin said at one point uh, don't ask me to quote the specific essay because this was <laughs> years ago i read this but uh he said something along the lines of trying to boil all human social development down to economics is like trying to boil all botany down to heat as if it's the only factor that contributes to botany is uh there's a multitude of factors that drive human social evolution and to say it's the economic that uh takes the lead in all cases is uh is reductionist mm mm-hmm and uh years later uh after this is after the bolshevik revolution i should say eric musum who's a criminally underrated theorist in his excellent uh summation of uh anarchist social theory and political theory uh the liberation of society from the state he said that the primary difference between anarchist theory and marxist theory is anarchists have a more holistic view of human social development they believe it's a dialectical uh dance between the uh social intellectual and the economic material whereas marxists believe everything can be boiled down to the economic slash material a term which uh i continue to find more and more frustrating the term material because mm -hmm. it's so vague in general and you can pretty much anything can be described as material and made to sound scientific uh by if you class it as material it sounds serious it sounds sciency not scientific but sciency and uh yeah i think that's why marxists like using it so much is uh they keep accusing anarchists of not having any clue about material analysis or materialist analysis and i always beg them to answer what specifically do you mean by that and they very rarely are able to come up with a concrete explanation that doesn't boil down to just reducing everything to economics yeah it is as as someone who you know learned to uh, learned about philosophy from a very particular perspective that begins with trying to define your terms as closely as possible the mm. looseness and the just the the ambiguity uh and and equivocation with regards to the term material and materialist is is deeply frustrating to me um there certainly seems to be some sort of indication of like yes we should if you're making a comment about you know um economics or or society that that should be grounded in something you can actually you know empirically analyze but it, yeah, it, exactly. Like yeah. You say, it, it, it doesn't seem to. It seems to me be a, a very weaselly word, uh, as it's used at least by by popular uh, in popular Marxism anyway. Yeah, I guess you could say it did have a very clear meaning 
at the time it first started being used in the way it's used. Uh, it right. had meaning it within it. Reacting to Hegel. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. At the time, uh, German idealism uh, referred to something very specific, and the materialists, as they called themselves, they were something very specific in relation to that. But uh, over time, those two terms, materialist and idealist, uh, they started being just used almost as cuss words, like you're a material, you're an idealist, uh, became mm -hmm. almost like you're a snot nose, like I don't like you, you're an idealist. It's but yeah, but what do, what do you mean by that? Like, like I, I've been called an idealist so many times, like, like, I in fact used to be an idealist when I was uh, a teenager. I was very into uh, Hindu and Buddhist uh, mysticism. I believed in a uh, view of the universe that's called panentheism and monistic idealism. That when you boil all matter down, uh, it's like it's consciousness. Like when you boil all ice down, it's water. It's what we perceive as the material universe is really a mental universe. That it's really consciousness in the mind of God. I don't really believe that anymore, but uh, according to Marxists, I apparently do because I don't believe that human social development can be boiled down to economics. Ergo, I believe that the universe is just thoughts in the mind of God. I'm like, I do not think those two are connected. Yeah, yeah, it, that's... It, it, again, it, I'm coming at uh, trying to get getting into more of this theory stuff for me coming from my background again sort of yeah the 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 idea of materialism versus idealism that i have been familiar with is exactly what you just described um thinking the that, universe is physical versus thinking the universe is a mental hologram yeah, or something yeah, like that yeah. and and yeah and at least my experience has been sort of stepping sideways into these debates is like you're not using these words correctly and i'm not i don't want to be a prescriptivist with regards to to, to language but you know yeah. you, it's just so sloppy how you're you claim to be the scientific uh mm. socialists but you're you which I actually I think Proudhon was the first one to, to use that yeah <laughs> that's the <laughs> irony at towards the end of what is property he uh said uh yeah that's uh he he actually coined the term scientific socialism in what is property i believe mm -hmm. oh sweet irony yeah yeah so uh and with regards to definitions i think this is a good point to to move on to is anarchism of course pretty much everybody understands that it is opposed to something called the state but what how anarchists define the state I, I get the sense is very different from how Marxists and and liberals and and, and others within this the, the the dog's breakfast of the left uh, define <laughs> a state. <laughs> uh, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, it's uh, it's this this is where even when I'm talking with uh, well-meaning Marxists and well-meaning liberals and. Uh, about the issue of the state, we tend to get into what, uh, there's a podcast I like called Seriously Wrong. They coined this very useful term, definition wobble, uh, to describe how, like, a word like table is very specific. Uh, there's no ambiguity about what a word like table or apple means. But when you use a very general term like state, then you'll, like, you ask 50 people, you'll get 60 different definitions of what a state is. Uh, because people will change their minds in mid-flow of the conversation. And Marxists, uh, sorry, no, not, not Marxists, anarchists generally define a state in a similar, if not identical way to the German sociologist uh, Max Weber, a monopoly on the legitimate use of physical force within a given territory. Uh, Peter Kropotkin in... I believe uh, anarchism, its philosophy and ideal, came up with a very similar definition at the in the first few paragraphs, something along the lines of it's a territorial uh, agglomeration of power situated above society. But I think both of those definitions are roughly compatible. But Marxists do not use that definition. To them, a state is just any kind of political organization 
in which one class wields power over another class. And this me in practice, these two competing definitions tend to cause debates between anarchists and Marxists, especially over the state, to break down because uh neither of them can agree on what that really means. Uh they they end up talking past each other and going on this merry go round uh in the discussion because uh they they neither one of them can agree on a clear definition of either what the state means or what class means or what it means for one class to wield power over another because mm -hmm. as far as anarchists are concerned if if the mass if the mass of the population let's call it the working class in the broadest possible sense wield power if they control the organs of political and economic power they're not wielding power over the ruling class because there no longer is a ruling class so it cannot be a state because there's no classes left anymore but yeah i can't even fully get my head around what marxists themselves think they mean when they say the proletariat will wield power over the bourgeoisie and i'm like wait a minute if the proletariat wield power then h how can the bourgeoisie still exist like i mean by definition like the, the, the only that's way, the kind of the only way it seems to make any sense to me is if you're using it in the sort of stalinist socialism in one country kind of mode where you have in theory a a workers state that is fighting the bourgeois states around it but even then yeah, yeah. You know, the actual fact of the ussr under lenin and then stalin um down to its dissolution was it was still a very much a class society with a ruling class over a, a working class not according to many marxists though yeah. because as far as they're concerned uh the Politburo and the upper echelons of the Communist Party cannot, by their definition, constitute a ruling class because even though they're politically different, they're economically the same as everybody else. They have the same relation to the means of production as, like, Stalin had the same relation to the means of production as a guy driving a forklift. And so, because they're economically the same, therefore, it is a classless society. Well, that seems to just, and to me, that just seems to twist words beyond all usefulness. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's again, that's, uh, as well as not being able to agree on a coherent definition of what a state is, there's also the disagreement on what a class is, because uh, if... If the upper echelons of the Communist Party don't co didn't constitute a ruling class because they economically, by Marxist definitions, weren't any different from ordinary workers, then can a discussion even take place on when talking about that issue? Because I don't think it can. Mm -hmm. When we can't even agree on what words mean, yeah, the discourse just kind of breaks down. Yeah, um, yeah, the word class as well, uh, is, uh, I mean, to me, it, it, it sort of is a fairly straightforward thing when you think, okay, the working class, you know, I'm, I'm in the industrial workers of the world, but that's the organization I'm in and that I promote. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we have a fairly straightforward definition of, you know, who is, working class who can join the organization, which is basically if you're not a cop, if you're not a politician, and if you're not a boss, you know, you don't have, you're not an employer, you don't, you know, have hiring and firing power, then you are in, in some sort of broad sense part of the working class, which mm -hmm. you know, makes, you know, is it the most, you know, clean cut definition? Not necessarily, but it, it, it makes a lot more sense and makes a you know is a lot much more useful than the sort of um the most of the marxist sort of definitions of what uh, of again bourgeois bourgeoisie petty bourgeoisie proletariat lumpen proletariat uh and how these interact with the the party 
um, and the role of the party mm-hmm. leading as as you know the vanguard and and so on and so forth. And it, it's um, I certainly am not a stranger to the need for oftentimes complex technical jargon for doing very difficult uh, theoretical work. But oh sure yeah, but uh, again in in actual practice. Um, the Marxist definitions seem to be shifting, shift a lot more, more easily than, you know, it doesn't seem like they're actually doing that. It certainly has the, the, the appearance in many ways of a sort of scientific technical discussion, but in practice, it seems to be much more, um, definition wobble. Yeah, it's serving an ideological purpose rather than a theoretical or analytic purpose. Mm. In many cases, serving to justify state power on the basis that it's technically classless in economic terms. And if the economic is the base of everything, the material base, then, and the political legal structure is nothing but a reflection of that base, if you can define a society as in technical terms, economically classless, then you can justify whatever kind of political power there happens to be by claiming, well, it's not part of the base of the material base of society. So what are you worried about? Uh, stop bothering me with this supernatural stuff. Like that, mm-hmm. that, that also I find very funny. If you read Lenin's writings, he uses the word supernatural to describe pretty much anything he disagrees with because there's one truth the marxist leninist truth uh and because that truth serves a class function the function of representing and uh enriching the interests of the proletariat uh if you disagree with me you are not only wrong your opinion is not only incorrect it is objectively bourgeois and objectively non-material and therefore supernatural (laughs) <laughs> so it's yeah it it gets a bit crazy how these uh terms are used and how these theoretical concepts are used to justify mm-hmm. uh power in general and state power in particular mm-hmm. yeah yeah it, it uh, it's uh yeah it, it is is very frustrating so even the word communism for instance is mm. This is one of the, this is one of the concepts I wanted to get to, but there definitely is this, and you bring up bring up Lenin. I think it's important to to note that within the Marxist tradition, you have these sort of lines of descent that go like Marx, Engels, Lenin, and then depending on how where you go from there, you know, you can there's that uh, tree tree branch thing, yeah, yeah. The, the sort of family tree of how how things develop. Whereas in anarchism. You definitely have this sort of right, this, the back and forth. Um, but there is no like one person who is the one you go back to. Like, exactly. It's based it, it, far it, it, more it, it, on the, the, yeah, there's far more of a geneal, genealogy of ideas rather than a genealogy of people, of, of, of leaders, so to speak. And, uh, uh, I believe David Graeber uh, once remarked that, have you ever noticed that uh, anarchists, the differences in anarchist schools of thought, they tend to be uh, separated in terms of the terms used to describe them by what they mean, whereas uh, in the Marxist schools of thought, they tend to be differentiated based on a particular person. Uh, within anarchism, you have communism, collectivism, individualism, mutualism, anarcho syndicalism so on these are all all of which describe either ideas or practices whereas with marxism you have leninism stalinism maoism luxembourgism they're all named after people so it tends to even indirectly lead to this kind of fidelity to people rather than fidelity to an idea or fidelity to a practice mm-hmm. It also seems very significant that, at least within anarchism, you know, none. Even though we have these these figures who have done, who we in some sense look up to as having written or or spoken or done important 
things, made important contributions to our practice and understanding, none of them are beyond criticism. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, Marxist, uh, sorry, go ahead. As I say, just sort of like by definition, almost, you know, and to the point yeah, that I mean, it's that's cliche to, to point out, you know, Proudhon was a anti-Semite and a misogynist. Uh, Bakunin. Bakunin was an anti-Semite as well. Both of them wrote uh, disgusting and reprehensible things about Jewish people, in Proudhon's case, about women, uh, and also Africans uh, in mm -hmm. his book, War and Peace. Uh, uh, in which he advocated a kind of colonialism, which often doesn't get remarked on, but that's yet another mark against uh, Proudhon. But uh, yeah, or or when it comes to Kropotkin uh, supporting the Allies in World War One, Marxists mm -hmm. often bring these things up as, ha, ah, well, uh, Proudhon said this and Kropotkin said that, and uh, we are generally like, uh, yeah, so <laughs> who cares? Like. You fuck him, like yeah, yeah. Um, Maybe not on every issue, but on that issue, yeah, fuck him. Yeah. Like I, I don't support him on that. But I guess they they come from a political culture where uh, fidelity to an idea also means fidelity to the person who espoused that idea, which I think is always a dangerous uh, practice, whether it's in politics or religion or ideology or sports or or whatever it may be. A absolutely um but and, but uh you were talking about the is it the genealogy of communism as an idea yeah cause, i mean that term even aside from the rhetorical use of it in uh american and, and broadly in the western red scares at different times this is a term that a lot of people both anarchists marxists and other uh socialists have adopted as uh, some sort of representation of, of the, what they believe in or what they strive for or what they represent. Mm. And that term, again, outside of the sort of propaganda uh, usage, even that seems there seems to be a difference between anarchist uh, communism versus uh, Marxist communism. Yeah. Uh it's funny if you trace the evolution of uh, how the word was used and uh, what it's come to mean throughout the years, because as far from what I've been able to dig up, the word communism is actually older by a couple of decades than the word socialism. It first seems to have emerged in the 1790s uh, in France, uh, where the terms communism and communionism uh, were used roughly as synonyms to Again, in, at the time, they, they weren't clearly pinned down as to what they meant. It just meant, uh, in the broad stroke sense, uh, a, future, a hypothetical future society in which everyone lived in some kind of communion. We were all in communion with each other, uh, used, used in a very vague way. And uh, in the 1820s and 1830s, the word socialism starts being used uh, as a rough synonym for this term as well. And uh, uh, what's often not remarked upon and what's not that very well known is Marx and Engels to this day will are and will be eternally associated with the word communism. Uh, but they actually, throughout their lives, uh, use the word socialism and communism as synonymous. To them, they were just two different words for the same thing. And indeed, even in 1849, when in the Communist Manifesto, they say something along the lines of the only reason we call ourselves communists instead of socialists is there's all these bourgeois and petty bourgeois and liberal uh, people who call themselves socialists. So we picked an older, more obscure term to define our own sect uh, to make ourselves stand out. But uh, in Germany, at least, uh, by the end of the 1870s and beginning of the 1830s, when uh, Marx died in uh, 1883, I believe, uh, the word communism had fallen out of fashion to such an extent and been replaced with socialism to such an extent that Engels later remarked that uh, 
you know, hardly anyone uses the word communist anymore. Everyone says socialist now. We're either socialists or social democrats. That if I could go back in time and rewrite our famous pamphlet, I would have called it the Socialist Manifesto instead, because the word communism now seems archaic. Uh, so, funnily enough, uh, between about 1880 and uh, 1917, Marxists hardly ever use the word communist. They, when they call themselves an ist or an ism of, uh, of some description, it was either Marxist, socialist, or social democrat. They hardly ever use the word communist. Who did use the word communist at around the same time from the eight, from around 1880 to 1917 were anarchists, uh, who first started using the term in the uh, 1870s to refer to a specific position within the anarchist movement as to how goods should be distributed uh, in a future anarchistic society uh, to distinguish themselves from another faction called collectivists. The collectivists believed that uh, they all agreed that the state should be abolished, capitalism should be abolished, markets should be abolished, but uh, the collectivists believed that uh, goods should be distributed on the basis of how much someone worked, on the basis of someone's contribution. The idea being that, well, if you do more work, uh, you get to consume more. Uh, if you work harder at more onerous tasks uh, throughout your life, you should get a bigger slice of the pie, which is the wider social product. Uh, uh, the communists, on the other hand, the anarchist communists, said that, well, it's not really possible to measure someone's contribution, so there's no way to dish things out according to contribution in a way that's uh, fair. So they said that just let people consume according to their needs. Uh, let people take from the pile whatever they need and anything that's not... Uh, plentiful enough to distribute uh, through freely taking things off shelves, let's find some way of rationing it out. Like, uh, let's give uh, medicine to those who are most in need of medicine. Let's give good food and to those who are dying, first of all, and uh, to everyone else second. Uh, and uh, yeah, th throughout the 1880s and 1890s, uh, the primary political uh, tendency that you, that described themselves as communists were in fact anarchists, and it was, I believe, them. And I can't find any information to contradict this. It was them who specifically defined communism as distinct from socialism as a stateless, marketless, classless, moneyless, specifically moneyless society. Uh, Marxists never made that distinction un until later between socialism and communism. Nowadays, uh, Marxists say. Socialism is when you still have money. Uh, communism is when we've abolished money. But uh, I believe it was anarchists who first made that distinction. And uh, Lenin started calling his particular faction of the Social Democratic uh, and Labour Party of Russia, uh, the Bolsheviks, uh, communists, as a, uh, again, adopting this, what was seen as an old fashioned term, as a way of distinguishing themselves from the Mensheviks and uh, the left social revolutionaries and the others in participating in the Russian Revolution as a way to make themselves stand out. Indeed, it, funnily enough, it was it was their use of the word communism in this way that at first led many anarchists around the world, from China and Japan to Germany to Britain to America, to falsely perceive uh, the Russian Revolution as an anarchist revolution, like Eric Musum, whom I mentioned earlier, uh, until he found out what was really going on in Russia, he described Lenin as a Bakuninist. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah at you first... Read, they, you read, at, you read the uh, Goldman and, and Berkman and, and Kropotkin and others yeah, exactly. to Russia in 1917. And, yeah, expecting something resembling an anarchist revolution and were dismayed as uh, what they found was uh, nothing nothing like what they had hoped to see when they heard uh, this was a communist revolution. Yeah, and I certain... believe Emma Goldman said that if, if communism means uh, the workers uh, controlling the factories and the farmers controlling the fields, then uh, 
Russia is one of the few places in the world where there's no communism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that is... is but a, the, I, the I, don't irony. I don't know if you've ever seen the film Reds, but there was a wonderful scene where... Uh, oh, yes, yeah, years ago, her, yeah. Her and um, the actors portraying Emma Goldman and, and uh, Jack Reed are... John going, Reed, yeah. yeah Warren Beatty's character, yeah. Yeah. Going at it over this very question. Uh, mm. and, yeah. But yeah, that's that's the irony, that uh, it was anarchists who... And again, uh, anyone who hears this podcast can correct me on this if I'm wrong, but I haven't been able to find any historical evidence that contradicts this. I do, in fact, think it was anarchists who first defined the word communism as meaning a stateless marketless, moneyless society, not Marxists or Leninists. It, that, their use of the term communism to mean that, to mean a what Marx himself called in the critique of the Gotha program, higher stage communism. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I believe that originally comes from anarchism, not from Marxism, although it's now associated with Marxism more yeah. than it is with anarchism. Yeah. Because, uh, of, the, because of the Bolshevik uh, adoption of that word, yeah, the, the the ignorance across the the left um, of of the Gotha critique is uh, dis disheartening uh, to me. So that's one of the more um, relevant and pertinent, and one of the more interesting things that Marx ever wrote. And, and that is where that that distinction comes. Which and then, it's not even it's it's not even that long. You can get through it in about an hour. Yeah, it's 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 shorter than the manifesto. Uh, <laughs> better than the manifesto. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and uh, it 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 beggars belief that uh, okay. Again, I I I've said this before that uh, if you if you follow me on Twitter, you've probably seen me say this. I don't agree with Marxian economics. I think there's it gets a few ideas right, even though it, it, Marx wasn't original in getting them right. It gets a lot wrong. I don't think it's relevant today, but. Uh, right-wing libertarians and conservatives still get Marxian economics wrong by not reading a short book he wrote called Value, Price, and Profit, in which he specifically says supply and demand does play a role in the formation of prices, yet they continu continually make this ridiculous straw man argument called the mud pies argument against Marxian economics, uh, mm -hmm. where they say that oh, well, if the labor theory of value is true, and if Marxian economics is true, then if I spend all day making pies made out of mud, they're therefore I can sell them at the same price as pies made out of apple, because if the amount of labor that goes into something rather than its uh, usefulness to somebody else is what determines value or its supply and demand, then mud pies should be just as valuable as uh, as apple pies. But this is a fundamental misunderstanding that could so easily be rectified if they just read this short book. I, I think you can get through it in about two hours called Value, Price, and Profit, in mm -hmm. which Karl Marx very clearly says, no, supply and demand do play a role in forming prices, but it's a secondary role to the amount of labor that goes into something. The, the amount of labor that goes into a product uh, forms a kind of center of gravity around which the price of the product revolves. and that it revolves based on changes in supply and demand. And that uh, if hypothetically supply and demand were exactly equal, then the price of an item would be the exact equivalent of the amount of labor that went into producing it. But uh, yeah, that it's so much ignorance. I, again, the, the, I do not believe in Marxian economics, but I think if you're going to criticize it, at least criticize it at its best, don't just make up nonsense based on ignorance and attack that instead. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's, uh, as I said, dis disheartening the number of people, again, particularly online. Um, but I, I, I try to restrict my, <laughs> I try to do, I try to do at least as much in, in person stuff on the ground, um, as I do mm -hmm. online. The number of people who, and I, I have to sort of wonder why Marxists and Marxians are so much better at popularizing their ideas through like YouTube videos and, and podcasts and stuff of 
you know, here's a 15 minute video describing the labor theory of value. Um, mm. and it's, you know, it, it just, I, I, I've met so many people who have sort of half listened to an audio book of the communist manifesto and now they're Marxists. And again, uh, agree or with, even disagree worse with that it. they've they've seen a couple they've shared a couple of memes uh, and suddenly they're Marxists or anarchists the other way. Uh, yeah, I can't tell you how many. Uh, <coughs> oh, excuse me. I can't tell you how many self-described ancoms anarcho-communists I've encountered who legitimately do not understand what anarchist communism is and think it's some kind of a synthesis of anarchism and Leninism. Yeah. And it, it sort of this thing they sorry, go ahead. No, uh, can continue. This is, I was just going to ask a little bit more about that. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, because the word communism has become so associated with Marxist Leninism, they think that anarchist communism, anarcho communism, and com ism is meant to be some kind of a fusion of that with anarchism. Like it, I might say something denouncing, uh, Lenin, and uh, I'll get somebody responding to me on Facebook or Twitter uh, saying something along the lines of, um, excuse me, anarcho-communism is a thing. I'm like, oh my god, I, I just put my hand over my face, like, do you know even the, f have you even, do you even have Wikipedia? Because even the Wikipedia, the first few paragraphs of the Wikipedia article on anarcho-communism would dispel this as a uh, ridiculous idea that anarchist communism is, is like a synthesis of anarchism and Leninism. Yeah, I mean, the, the I, I've hung out with, you know, I've been out drinking with uh, a, a group of, you know, anarchists and anarcho-communists, the actual ones that know their stuff, and after, after, after a pint or two, uh, they're very, everybody's very ready to just call Lenin a, 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 uh, a rightward deviation from socialism and a counter revolutionary. <laughs> mm. It is astounding the number of pe pe self described anarchists online and even so, to some extent in person who will defend Lenin or say, Oh, but haven't you read State and Revolution? Uh, as if that was the yeah, only the thing he ever wrote. <laughs> that that was in fact the book that uh, Eric Musum uh, read and declared him a Bakuninist because he saw some similarities between what Lenin wrote in State and Revolution and uh, Bakunin's view on uh, how a revolution should go down. But uh, yeah, it's uh, I remember I was part of this Facebook group called I think either just Anarcho Communism or Anarcho Communism One Hundred One and. Uh, it was a massive group. I think it had something like 10,000 members, but uh, I was at first banned for criticizing a meme someone shared praising Che Guevara. I was like, you know, like Che Guevara was like an authoritarian statist who like murdered, like who either murdered or expelled tons of anarchists. And okay, first thing uh, somebody responded, found the white anarchist. I'm like, the hell does being white have to do with like? First of all, Che Guevara was white. He was he was of Irish descent. His mother's maiden name was Lynch. Like he, Argentina mm. is a majority white country. Like what what the hell does that have to do with? Uh, but I kept arguing and was eventually banned. Then I they had an appeals group, uh, anarcho communism one hundred one appeals or something for people who felt they had, they had been banned unjustly, and I was also banned from that group on the basis that I had used the word silly, which I was told was an ableist slur. And because I refused to uh, admit it was ableist and apologize, I was then banned from that group. And uh, yeah, uh, it's, but yeah, it, I, I went back since and the group has basically become a cesspool of memes praising Stalin and praising Mao and, uh, despite calling itself uh, anarcho-communist. Uh, this other, uh, I guess th this is part of the weird world I I'm in. I'm also the uh, administrator of this uh, group on uh, Facebook for fans of LeftTube. And uh, so I know a lot about the, the weird insular culture of left-wing Facebook, or leftbook as it's called. But uh, there was this page, I'm us. not sure if it's still, <laughs> say again? I uh, just said, God save us. 
Yes, yes. Uh, uh, there was this page calling itself Anarcho-Transhumanism, which uh, by the end had switched almost exclusively to sharing content praising Stalin and Mao, yet continually refused to change its name to... Uh, sorry, not anarcho-transhumanism. Uh, uh, what was it again? Uh, it was something to do with transgender politics. Was it uh, anarcho-transfeminism? I think that's what it was. But yeah, by the end uh, of its... I'm, it may still be around. I'm not sure. It may have changed its name since. But uh, yeah, it basically switched to sharing nothing but Stalin and Mao memes and uh, lambasting... Uh, Anarchides, uh, to use a common slur they use, but, uh, not a slur, sorry, it's just a kind of a yeah. silly name, but, uh, yeah, but, uh, I was like, why are you still calling yourself an anarchist? I, I, I don't get it. Like, all you're doing is, is, y you've become an authoritarian, uh, communist, so why do you even feel the need to call yourself an anarchist? It's, uh, this other group I'm part of, uh, I, I asked a couple of them this, and they just said, well, I joined when I was still an anarchist, then I've I've since seen the light, but, you know, I'm still here, so why not try to educate the anarchities on uh, the immortal science of dialectical materialism? I mean, just, it, it is deeply frustrating because it, uh, the, I think that there there is a value in uh, engaging in diversity of thought, but this sort of syncretism, it just, all it does is it, it takes the worst elements <laughs> of, of everything and sort of mixes them into a melange of that, that values as the aesthetics of leftism over any substance. That, yeah, I think most of the people who tend to, uh, adopt these positions call themselves anarcho communists while being while dis, you know, being indistinguishable from their rhetoric between hardcore Stalinists and Maoists, uh, they do sent, they do seem to exist primarily online. Like, I, I think they're mostly either teens or 20 somethings who discovered left wing politics primarily via memes or YouTube videos, uh, who don't really read books, even audiobooks, and, uh, decide to adopt this as their online identity while not really doing anything to do with politics in mm -hmm. meat space, in the physical world. It's mostly just the cultivation of an online identity to make themselves feel a part of something. Uh, someone I'm in contact with on Twitter, whose work I mostly admire, uh, except on economics, uh, William Gillis, he's been part of the activist scene in the Pacific Northwest for uh, donkey's years, and he is convinced that all of these people are just Marxist-Leninist infiltrators pretending to be anarchists so as to fool uh, misguided young people into thinking anarchism and authoritarian statism are compatible. I don't have that view. I've spoken with many of them, and they do seem to be just genuinely deluded that these two trains of thought are incompatible with one another. Yeah, yeah, I'm, this is why I'm sort of anti-bread tube, personally. Um, I think that my, my own, in, in the, this, in the show, and this will go in the introduction after I've edited this and, uh, publish it in, in a day or two, but I always start off by saying, cancel all your Patreons and join an organization and do actual work. <laughs> uh, uh, well, I don't have quite the same view. I, uh, if I were, I wouldn't have, uh, founded and, uh, been the administrator of a, uh, the largest group on Facebook, uh, yeah. catering to that audience. But I, yeah. I do fair. think there's, fair, fair. Uh, I, I don't really, I, I don't really like the term bread tube. I prefer left tube. Uh, it's just clearer about what it means, but, uh, I do think there's good left tube and bad left tube. Uh, it can be a valuable resource for, uh, de-radicalizing uh, people who've fallen down the right-wing or alt-right rabbit hole for uh, introducing them to new ideas and uh, educating them about particular topics. Uh, however, there is, I guess you could say, the dark side of left tube, which is 
I don't want, I don't know, should I mention any names, but there's definitely uh, names of some people who will steer young people down a dark path just as much as the alt-right side of the internet will. Yeah, and I, I, I suppose my own experiences with the um, rather rabid fan base of even the most wholesome people in, in the left tube world has colored my own views on, on this, but uh, that's sort of besides the point. Going back to more sort of a discussion of anarchist theory, um, again, one of the points that one of the things that we discussed that we touched on earlier was this sort of the development of of theory and, and practice in looking at these different sort of strains of of, of leftism and in anarch it, it, again sort of going back to the point where we talked about this sort of in, if you're Marxist everything sort of goes back to Marx and certainly there are people within the Marxian stream that have developed their analyses and critiques in in, in many different ways. But because it sort of always has to go back to this this point of reference of you know you always have, you know, grounding yourself in capital or in uh, you know the Grundrisse or something. Um, compared yeah, different factions tend to prefer uh, different books. Like uh, most Marxists prefer Capital Volume One. Autonomous Marxists tend to prefer the Grundrisse, and uh, yeah, right, yeah. Um, but with, with anarchism, there has been this sort of constant, again, you sort of use the word dialectical, uh, uh, development of, of theory. And again, mostly not, not in books as much as in like essays, uh, uh and in letters. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, um, it, it's been very, uh, well, anarchic uh, in the more I wonder, commonly used I, I kind of wanted to ask if you could go over a little bit of the history of some of these figures and how anarchist theory has sort of developed with sort of an eye towards if I want, if I or whoever, whatever person listens to this wants to read a little bit more about this or study some, like what sort of de de uh, periods of development, you know, should we look into down to current writers uh, in developing, whether it's the more classical critique of political economy or more recent, you know, critiques and analyses. Yeah, good question, uh, and uh, a question that doesn't get asked enough. Uh, it Just talking about social, let's call it social anarchism, as distinct from individualist anarchism, which is really its own thing off to the side, just focusing on that stream. So let's call it uh, collectivist and communist and syndicalist, uh, the strains of anarchism. Let's put those under an umbrella and call that social anarchism. From about the eighteen, the late eighteen seventies to around the uh, beginning of World War One, it was there was a very clear unity of ideas uh, and practices within uh, social anarchism. They did disagree on many things, but there was they were still uh, united in a very common and very coherent uh, set of ideas and practices, which they developed, uh, which various theorists like Peter Kropotkin, Elise Reclus, er Errico Malatesta, Emma Goldman, Alexander Berkman, they all developed these uh, ideas, mostly through newspapers and journals, uh, books as well, although even their books, like, for example, The Conquest of Bread, were originally published in newspapers uh, or in journals in serialized form. And uh, like uh, Anarchopack, who's a, a YouTuber, uh, who she uh, she actually introduced me to a lot of uh, new anarchist ideas uh, about 10 years ago, I think it was, uh, when she first started making videos. Uh, she's now doing a PhD on the history of anarchism, and uh, she says that a lot of people have this misleading idea that anarchist theory, that the idea, the ideological basis of anarchism is chaotic and all over the place. But she said that uh, from studying all of the stuff in the classical period, uh, I actually get bored of how samey it all sounds, because they're all saying basically the same thing. But it's only really after World War II, uh, the period in between that 
two world wars was kind of a transitional period for anarchist uh, thought. But uh, after World War II, you get this kind of splintering where uh, it seemed that uh, with the establishment of the Iron Curtain and uh, the two superpowers warring against each other, uh, many anarchists started uh, taking a good long look at themselves and thinking, well, what now? Like, is anar- is are our hopes for global anarchist revolution finished, or should anarchism become something else? And uh, with for a few, for about a decade or two, uh, anarchism was tied very closely to the pacifist movement, which is a period of anarchist history, which I think deserves a lot more attention. But uh, the mm-hmm. anarchism in the uh, from the end of World War Two to the 1960s. Uh, but you have people like Colin Ward and Paul Goodman and Nicholas Walter and uh, Berenyi and uh, all these thinkers who were trying to make anarchism into something different from what it had been while still being true to what it always had been. And uh, there's some really interesting theory from the time, like uh, Paul Goodman's uh, Communitas and uh, Colin Ward's Anarchy in Action. Uh, Well, that was written a bit later, but uh, the ideas come from that period. Uh, Nicholas Walters about anarchism and... uh, they presented a vision of what anarchism should be that uh, in some ways was going back to the gradualist uh, approach of Proudhon, that uh, anarchism shouldn't try to change the world in one big, massive, uh, popular uprising. We should instead content ourselves to changing the world gradually and more piecemeal, like extending the spheres of free action until they encompass all society, to uh, paraphrase Paul Goodman. But uh, in the 1960s, you see a shift in which anarchism gets a lot more insurrectionary. With uh, It blends with a lot of the same ideas, uh, especially in the United States, of the student anti-war left, uh, like Students for a Democratic Society and the Black Panthers, and a lot of, the, a lot of ideas started getting mixed up with one another, like uh, the White Panthers, who were a white support group to the Black Panthers, they, their ideas were a kind of weird mishmash of anarchism and Leninism, almost trying to make them mesh with one another. Uh, and uh, throughout the 70s and 80s, you see all these different hyphenated forms of anarchism coming out. You have anarcho-capitalism, anarcho-primitivism. Uh, you, it's, it's, it starts to look a bit more chaotic, where you you have like for every idea in human conception, there's like an anarcho hyphen that for it. So mm-hmm. this, uh, this, as you said earlier, dog's dinner of uh, anarchist uh, hyphen hyphens uh, starts to make it a lot more chaotic than it uh, looked in the past. And it looks like there is no unified anarchist theory because they all disagree with each other. You could look at it on paper and go, well, what on earth do communists, capitalists, primitivists, transhumanists, ecologists, what do they all have in common other than they all have anarcho-something attached to their names? But if you just focus on social anarchism, again, it looks a lot more coherent. Uh, There's uh, two theorists in particular I want to mention. Uh, Alan Carter, who first started writing in the 1980s, and he stopped writing in, I believe, 98 or 99, but he produced uh, three works of anarchist theory which uh, don't receive nearly enough attention, which uh, I think should be read a lot more. The first, uh, I'm going to skip his middle book because it's about uh, right-wing libertarianism, which I think, you know, you, you, <laughs> nobody needs another critique of why it's ridiculous. I mean, it's yeah. quite self-evident why it's ridiculous. But there is Marx a Radical Critique was his first book, which is... I think the best uh, systematic breakdown of Marxism and why it's a bad idea for leftists to be enthralled to these ideas, That's I think it's the best one of those that's ever been written, and it's from an anarchist perspective. And the second is, uh, I believe from 98 or 99, a radical green political theory, which uh, provides a really unified and coherent uh, vision of what anarchist theory should be and offers many, uh, for any anarchists that may have thought, well, 
you know, I like being an anarchist. I, I think it's a great vision for what the world ought to be, but theoretic, theoretically, it doesn't seem that rich. A lot of the ideas seem undercooked. This book, I think, would change your mind about that. Uh, it starts with Murray Bookchin's uh, Social Ecology, that his theoretical corpus also... Uh, that that I think is is a lot more popular nowadays as well. Although I think in some cases people draw the wrong conclusions from it. But uh, yeah, that, that's the first uh, anarchist theorist that I wish a lot more people would check out. The second is Jesse Cohen, who wrote uh, two books, but uh, his theory book is called Anarchism and the Crisis of Representation, which uh, formally it's presenting a unified anarchist theory of aesthetics and aesthetic philosophy although i think it also functions as a more general anarchist uh view of reality uh, an anarchist way of analyzing how the world works uh both again bo both of these works i wish they were more beginner friendly they are kind of academic and kind of uh terminologically dense, but I think if you are able to decipher your way through the terminology, both of those books, A Radical Green Political Theory by Alan Carter and uh, Anarchism and the Crisis of Representation by Jesse Cohen, they're excellent books to read. And I think uh, if you want to get serious about developing the theory side of anarchism, uh, those are essential works to check out from recent years. I mean, uh, if we were to go into every book I think is worth uh, reading from anarchism's history, I think <laughs> this would go on for about six hours. Yeah, 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 definitely. I guess just the cliff notes. For, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just say yeah. I mean, we could. I mean, there, there's been. I, I mean, I have a very long reading list myself. I do want to look at, or at least you know, go through you know what is property by Perdon, and um, I think it's farms, fields, and workshops by Kropotkin. Uh, Fields, Factories, and Fields, Workshops yeah. by Peter Kropotkin, yeah. Uh, the Center for a Stateless Society, actually, they developed, a, they put together a PDF version that uh, cuts out all the stuff that's no longer relevant and only presents the useful information. Uh, it's available on their website. It's, it's, if you're going to check out any version of that book, that's the best one to check out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, but, that's definitely... Like I said, I'm going to read it, um, hopefully, soon, <laughs> and I'd encourage everybody to... Yeah, uh, the the one nobody checks out, though, and I think this is probably... Uh, I think if you're going to read Peter Kropotkin's theory, the best book you can check out is the AK Press edition of Modern Science and Anarchy, uh, edited and compiled by Ian McKay. I think that's the... Everyone says there, there's this meme online now of read the bread book, but... Uh, it's an important book, The Conquest of Bread. It describes uh, how to reorganize a city after a hypothetical anarchist uh, uprising, but uh, it's not a very good introduction to anarchism. It, it was written yeah. uh, with, with the. It was written for people who were already anarchists and wanted a kind of proof of concept in uh, written form. It was written for uh, an anarchist uh, journal. Uh, I'm not, I'm having trouble remembering which journal it was. Uh, it was either La Revolte or it was uh, Freedom, the British anarchist newspaper. I can't mm -hmm. remember which one, but it was originally written for people who were already readers of an anarchist journal and therefore presumably already anarchists who wanted uh, more information as to how all of this would work in practice. But as uh, as an introduction to Kropotkin's work, I think... The best place to start is probably his essay, Anarchism, Its Philosophy and Ideal. That's the, or Anarchist Morality. Both of those essays are, are good entry points, both to Kropotkin and to anarchist theory. And as we're, we're talking, I'm, I'm just checking online. It looks like almost everything you're, you're mentioning is available either on libcom.org or the, or library. the anarchist library. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's they're both fantastic resources. Only uh, uh, I tend to recommend both websites with a bit of caution because uh, Libcom has a lot of Marxist nonsense on it, and uh, the Anarchist Library has a lot of nihilist and primitivist nonsense on it. So both have very good texts that you should check out, but you also need to 
wade through a lot of, I think, disinformation in order to get to the good stuff. But both, in terms of what they offer, both are excellent resources. Yeah, yeah. The uh, uh, It's probably in a completely separate question, but like, I, I do wonder why why has primitivism and anti-civ, uh, anti-civilizational stuff become sort of ascendant lately, but it, it, uh, as I said, probably completely different, uh, <laughs> different show. I, th- I think it's actually kind of on, I think it's kind of on the decline in terms of, uh, how prominent it used to be in mm. activist circles. Uh, William Gillis actually has on the anarchist library, a, uh, I forget the name of the essay, but it's, uh, there, there's two actually. One is a general history of anarcho primitivism. The other is a more thorough critique of it uh, on an ideological level. But uh, if you look at its roots, it's kind of funny that it evolved not out of anarchism, but out of a weird ultra heterodox sect of French Marxism, French ultra left Marxism. Like if you, the founding theorist of anarcho primitivism, uh, let's just call it primitivism, because I don't consider it really to be a legitimate uh, form of anarchism. Uh, John Zerzan, he he first started writing essays as an ultra-left Marxist uh, who was inspired by this French thinker, what was his name? It was Jacques Camate, I, I forget what his last name was, but uh, this was uh, a branch of, a weird branch of French Marxism that believed that uh, all hopes of a Marxist revolution were gone, and the best we could hope for now is just uh, the complete destruction of civilization. Mm. Zerzan is the one who so if you trace that all the problems in, in, for humans go back to the development of language, if I recall correctly. Uh, not just language, but also numbers, counting, acknowledging the passage of time. Uh, it's it's abstract thought. It's it's basically when you read some of his writing, like maybe some of it is hyperbolic, but. Uh, you would swear that he wants uh, humanity to not only go back to being hunter-gatherers, but to devolve to the level of where we are not even homo sapiens anymore, where we're pre-verbal hominids. Hmm. That's that's the only way where we can ever be in the moment and be happy. Like, there's there's this passage in one of his books that's about like against the concept of counting that when we all go to dinner to have a meal together you can tell without counting if somebody should be there uh who isn't there if there's two children who are lost in the woods somewhere you don't need to count them as one two in order to recognize that there are people who should be there but yeah it get it gets a bit nuts at times yeah I can understand in on some level why this caught on in the 80s and 90s. People, I think, incorrectly associated technological progress with the destruction of the environment, when in fact, uh, this is where uh, I think Murray Bookchin and social ecology, that theory is correct and primitivism is incorrect. I think the problem is not technology. I don't think technology is inherently... Ecocidal. I think the way technology is instrumentalized by whatever given system we live under, if you live under a statist market driven system, then you're going to get technology that uh, aids that system in enforcing itself on people. I think it is not technology itself that drives the system, it's the system that drives technology. Mm hmm. You mentioned Bookchin. He's one of two people I wanted to get uh, your 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 thoughts on. He's Bookchin has certainly become again something of a meme. You know, I've seen a lot of like Google book Google Murray Bookchin stuff. Google Murray I, Bookchin, yeah. I, and I've I haven't read as deeply in his stuff as I would like to. But my impression is he. I mean, he wasn't. He was a Marxist. He was an anarchist, and he later disavowed both. Um, and I'm wonder mm. if it. If what of his his work is the most valuable for you know modern people that that want to be you know social anarchists? Yeah, I think that for people who want to be social anarchists, I think his work dating from around the mid nineteen sixties up to and including uh, 
his work in the mid 1980s is the stuff you should read from the about 1990 onwards he was still producing i think some valuable stuff but i thought his thinking became a lot more conservative a lot more knee jerk ish uh a lot more he became far too in interested in polemics in tearing down anybody he perceived to be in even remote disagreement with him as a bourgeois reactionary and not interested enough in taking stock of what's going on in the world and how to best uh deal with his problems so i you could you could almost divide he he would obviously himself and a lot of people who like bookchin's later work would disagree with this characterization but i think i think there's really two bookchins there's the anarchist bookchin let's call it and the communalist bookchin uh, uh where the stuff you wrote in the 60s and 70s is very anarchistic the stuff you wrote in the 90s and 2000s up to when he died was the communalist bookchin and the 19 his stuff he was writing in the 1980s is a kind of transitional period where he was morphing from one to the other uh if you were to read works like post scarcity anarchism towards an ecological society the ecology of freedom but then later read works like uh social anarchism or lifestyle anarchism or the mm. communalist project you would be shocked that uh these were written by the same person because they're so dramatically different in tone and in approach uh the bookchin the anarchist bookchin seems to be to me at least to be a thinker that was on the money about 90% of the time whereas communalist bookchin again he he seemed too he seemed his mind seemed too settled on what he believed was right and could not stand even being near anybody intellectually speaking whom he perceived to be in even the tiniest bit of disagreement with him so he wrote these endless polemics that uh lambasted anyone and everyone including anarchists uh uh even though he identified as an anarchist for most of his political life although to be fair and uh his ex-partner uh Jeanette Beale has uh, gone on record saying this. He was mostly, when he said, quote unquote, anarchists, he was mostly thinking of primitivists and nihilists he was mm. in dialogue with at the time, whom he perceived to have taken over anarchism. That, so his attitude was basically, well, if, that would, if that's what anarchism has become, I'm no longer an anarchist. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, I can definitely see someone yeah, I think who was you know, rooted in the social anarchist tradition would reject nihilism and, 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 and primitivism. And if that's what anarchism means, then would reject anarchism. Yeah, something like that, yeah. But I, I think in his work in the 60s, 70s, and early 80s, there are the seeds of a different form of social anarchism both theoretically and practically that never really got off the ground it evolved into something else that he called communalism but i think if people are willing to take those seeds and grow them into something else i think that would be my ideal for what social anarchism would be if if i were king of the world and were allowed to <laughs> invent a whole movement that's that's what i would invent uh that's kind of the what the my profile on twitter is so solar punk anarchist uh it's what i call myself mm -hmm. uh that's kind of the general uh set of ideas i tend to push mm -hmm. on people but one one person the last the last thread of bookchin's anarchism in the 60s and 70s is is what i what it would be if it didn't evolve into communalism if it had, if it evolved into mm -hmm. something else now one of the the figure, the other sort of meme figures that I wanted to uh, at least get get your sense of is um, would be uh, Max Stirner, who I mean we've mostly been talking about social right. anarchism. He's a figure that is by and large associated with with individualist anarchism and nihilism, and and, and what's usually called egoism. But a lot of you know myself, I, I would consider myself a, a social anarchist and a lot of other people have found an enormous amount of value in his work beyond the uh, calling right. everything I don't like a spook. Uh, <laughs> mm. 
And that's what, and funnily enough, that that's only a very small part of the book, the unique in its property. And he's specifically talking about religion in that case. I mean, yes, it can be extended to other things, but yeah, that that does annoy me too. Uh, calling everything you don't feel like dealing with intellectually a spook, like you're a spook, you're a spook. He, he, you're a spook. he uses the Everyone's term fixed idea, all. I think, more much more often than he does whatever. I forget what mm. the German word is, but. Uh, yeah, yeah, and there's there's various different translations. There's uh, Benjamin Tucker's, or I forget who translated it into English. Yeah, I think it was Benjamin Tucker uh, translated it into English as uh, the ego and its own, mm -hmm. or maybe it was John Henry McKay. I'm I'm not sure, but uh, he was German, recall. so I'm sure he did the. There German, was a more but, recent yeah. one by Wolfie. I can never pronounce his. Lenstriker, yeah, I think it's Lenstriker, yeah. Uh, not a fan of his own theory, but I, I think his translation is very good, and his translation notes uh, are very illuminating, that when Stirner uses this word, he means this specific thing, mm -hmm. but, so his introduction is, is well worth reading. I yeah, think... Translated yeah, to uh, those critics, if I recall, which... Yes. Which so everybody I, who, I, who, everybody who throws uh, around spook memes should, should read. <laughs> Yeah. first before they ever read the book it's and and his other essay the false principle of our education uh yeah Stirner is is a thinker whom i think has a lot of potential for uh being how should i put this uh he his work is far more associated with individual what's called individualist anarchism and nihilism and I won't deny that if you read his work in a certain way, you can find intellectual justification in Stirner for that particular type of politics and that particular type of thinking. But I don't think it's the only uh, line of thinking or mode of politics you can get from reading his work. I think it's just as applicable to social anarchism if you read it in a pro-social kind of way, because and especially, I think, everybody who's going to read Stirner should read Stirner's critics before they read his big book, uh, The Unique and Its Property. Even though it was written later, it clarifies a lot of things in advance that uh, uh, people tend to misread in The Unique and Its Property, uh, or The Ego and Its Own, as it uh, was the original name of the translation. The Unique and Its Property, I believe, is uh, more accurate to the original German. Uh, but... Uh, he very specifically says in that essay, I am not against socialists, only what he calls sacred socialists, people who make socialism into this almost a religion, into this abstraction, into this uh, fixed idea that doesn't allow itself to be open to criticism. He Ideas for Stirner should be vehicles, not uh, cathedrals. You shouldn't plant them somewhere and... Uh, grow things around them. You should use them more like boats rather than as buildings. You should use them to achieve something or get somewhere, not uh, turn them into sacred objects and worship them. And I think he provides maybe the best intellectual justification uh, I've ever read for an anti-authoritarian view of the world, uh, even more so than many social anarchists. They're great at talking about uh, the problems with the state, the problems with the market. Uh, Stirner is magnificent for understanding the world on a far deeper psychological and uh, intellectual level. So, yeah, I don't think uh, we should give up uh, Stirner to the nihilists, because I don't think his ideas necessarily lend themselves to that exclusively. And many social anarchists felt the same way. Uh, Emma Goldman felt that way. She wrote, she saw no contradiction whatsoever between combining the ideas of Stirner and Kropotkin. Neither, neither did many of the uh, Spanish anarchists in the uh, FAI who uh, shared work uh, in their journals by both Stirner and Kropotkin or Malatesta and uh, saw them as perfectly compatible. Yeah, uh, Stirner provides the intellectual critique of society and uh, other social anarchists provide a more economic or ethical critique of society. And uh, I think what's uh, best worth uh, taking up from Stirner's work is that uh, it sounds on the surface to be 
excessively individualist when you say that everybody is entirely unique and to each person the entire world is their property. Uh, but if you read this in a pro-social way, the fact that all of us are completely unique, self-serving individualists, that eliminates all artificial barriers that may exist between people that get in the way of forming connections. So when looked at in that way, it eliminates all artificial barriers that exist between people and therefore provides a solid philosophical and psychological foundation for creating connections, for solidarity, in other words. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I would say that in addition to that, one of the reasons why I find have found myself moving from, you know, the various ideologies of, of my youth and, and upbringing to where I am now in anarcho-communism uh, is that it really for me comes down to valuing my own uniqueness and individuality and realizing that the conditions under which I, as a individual human person, can flourish are necessarily ones of, of, again, the sort of anarchist, social anarchist communism. Uh, and that, and that, that's true for everybody because the forces of, of capitalism, of, of all the other forms of oppression and hierarchy, um, prevent me from being, uh, for lack of a better phrase, my own full, most fully true self that I could possibly be from, from realizing my potential. Completely. I mean, that's that's what Oscar Wilde said in The Soul of Man Under Socialism. He yeah. said, socialism, by which he really seems to mean something resembling yeah. anarchist communism, he said, socialism is a value precisely because it will lead to individualism. You'll no longer be worried about the phony altruism of having to worry about how your neighbor is doing, because your neighbor will be able to take care of themselves. Uh, solving the economic problem and solving the political problem of authority will enable everybody to to relate to one another as free individuals rather than as higher and lower or as master and slave or as uh, superior and inferior. Once you eliminate hierarchy and you eliminate deprivation, everyone is free to be their own unique selves. Yeah, I mean, the soul of man under socialism is sort of my... When, when I read that, it was... Uh, there's my sort of road of road to Damascus moment <laughs> of like, Oh, this is, this is what I've been looking for the the whole time. And it's not for everybody, but at least the, the opening uh, few pages, I think is sort of what I generally recommend. To yeah. The opening on the opening and the closing, I would say there's this weird digression where he starts talking about several pages about interior design, yeah. which I'm uh, like, <laughs> okay, fine. Mr. Wild, that this belongs in a different essay. Yeah. Can you cut this bit out and, Go back to what you were talking yeah. about. Have please. you have you read? Uh, there was a book that just came out from AK Press by Christian Williams on uh, the anarchism of Oscar Wilde. Have you read that or looked it up? I have not yet. I have read uh, Christian Williams' uh, book Wither Anarchism, which I think is a great little pamphlet and uh, puts forward, in fact, a lot of the. Uh, issues I have with the contemporary anarchist uh, movement. And uh, I think, I wish he made it freely available online. I think you can only get it through AK Press at the moment. But if ever he makes it available on the anarchist library, I'd encourage everybody to read that little pamphlet of his uh, Wither Anarchism, because it, it boils down to the essentials, uh, what I think, uh, both what many of the problems with contemporary anarchism is, and many of the potential solutions, which is... Uh, Let's stop pretend. Let's stop doing anarchism in such a way that we're pretending we already live in it. That uh, it tends to lead to. I mean, I hate the term; it's so misused. But it tends to lead, in some cases, to what's commonly called cancel culture. People policing each other's behavior and for for not being an absolute saint. And again, I hate that. I've come to hate mm -hmm. the term cancel culture because of how it's misused by the right. But. Uh, it can be a real problem, and it can certainly, I've seen it become a problem in anarchist spaces and in left spaces more generally. And uh, it starts by admitting, okay, we're not perfect, uh, let's try and see ourselves as a work in progress, and also let's get better about uh, developing solid theoretical foundations for 
what be, what we believe in rather than this grab bag of elements taken from feminism marxism uh uh critical race theory it, it's the, i do think a solid and co coherent theoretical basis for anarchism is out there if uh it's just most people don't read the books that i think would be most valuable towards uh developing it uh, i already mentioned two already as well as uh several classical anarchists you have a radical green political theory by mm -hmm. ellen carter and uh anarchism and the crisis of representation by jesse mm -hmm. cohen very academic books but i think if somebody could take those and synthesize the ideas and put them in a more popularly uh digestible book uh and share it online widely uh we'd be we'd have far less people becoming anarchists through memes and thinking it's compatible with marxist leninism let's say mm -hmm. yeah it's uh yeah this has been a really great conversation i, I to sort of close out um you know, yeah. yeah we're coming yeah. up to the two yeah. hour mark now yeah. and uh just, yeah it's our, the conversations feature yes, at yes. this point uh to close out i wanted to get your your thoughts on we, we've spent a great deal of this talking about the some of the failures or, or, or anarchist criticisms of marxism um but do you think there is any sort of aside from the tactical alliances that we spoke about earlier do you think there's any sort of possible rapprochement between at least some of the more libertarian strains of Marxism uh, and, and anarchism. I know there's some people, but. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, there, there already have been in the past, uh, like for example, uh, autonomous Marxism, which, uh, okay. Yes. I disagree with uh, some of what they believe on theoretical grounds, but I think in terms of practice, uh, they're almost indistinguishable from, I think, the best of social anarchism. I mean, in Italy and Germany in the uh, 60s, 70s, and 80s, the uh, autonomia and the uh, autonomen in both countries, they were the closest thing uh, those two countries had to an anarchist movement. And I think it surpassed a lot of what passed for anarchism in, say, France or Britain at the same time. Hmm. So yeah, I and I do think uh, even I do think there's even theoretically some useful ideas to take uh, from those schools of thought from autonomous Marxism, uh, like for example the idea of class composition. How every class formation has both a political composition and a technical composition has both uh, the it's what it what makes it up economically in terms of the skill sets of people and. Uh, the kind of technology that's being used and uh, what they believe, politically speaking, should be the way of the world. I think those are useful ideas that can and should be adopted by anarchists as part of their own analysis. And certainly everything they're doing, practically speaking, I think is worth uh, emulation. Uh, Kevin Carson right now is uh, working on a book. Uh, I believe he's going to make it uh, public domain called Exodus, in which he's laying out uh, a number of uh, solutions taken from, uh, I again, uh, what I think are the best elements of both uh, autonomous Marxism, uh, eco-socialism, and social anarchism uh, into a stew that I think is, it's definitely going to be worth reading when it comes out. I, I don't agree with uh, what's called market anarchism on uh, the end goal. Uh, I would favor a stateless, marketless, moneyless society, libertarian communism, as what I'd like the end goal to be. But I think uh, people like Kevin Carson and William Gillis, uh, both of whom consider themselves market anarchists, they are currently writing some of the most interesting and some of the most uh, together theory when with regards to things like uh, economic strategy for fighting against capital and the state and uh, technology, what kind of technologies we should be adopting and how we should be using them both to fight capital and the state and to replace them with uh, something better. Mm -hmm. Well, that's excellent. Well, final final question. Uh, is there such a thing as a justified hierarchy? Okay. <laughs> no. No. Simple answer, no. <laughs> I, I get why Noam Chomsky... Uh, 
came up with this uh, line he tends to feed people of, uh, when I say about abolishing hierarchy, I'm only talking about unjustified uh, hierarchy. Or I think he used the word authority rather than hierarchy. He said that, uh, well, when a, a three-year-old girl runs out into the middle of the road, grabbing her is a justified authority. And I think that, well, really, when you break it down, if you're not using the word authority to mean expertise or expert, uh, there really is no such thing in anarchist terms, I would argue, as a justified authority. A teacher, a teacher-student relationship, a parent-child relationship, none of those are necessarily authorities or hierarchies if you're doing them well. They become reciprocal uh, exchanges in which uh, someone with more knowledge or expertise imparts it to someone with less, because the whole point of that relationship is to bring the one without knowledge or skill up to the same level as the person that's imparting it to them. They're not necessarily authorities or hierarchies. So, uh, no, I, I don't really think there's such a thing. Depending on how you define the words, I, I, I don't really think you can say there's such a thing as a justified authority or a justified hierarchy. So, yeah, I <laughs> wish that uh, meme would stop being circulated. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, my, my own view has is then if you can justify it, it isn't really a hierarchy. Exactly, exactly. It ceases to be, it, the moment it it is justified in anti-authoritarian terms, it's no longer a hierarchy, it's become something else. Well, thank you very much. Uh, this has been a really great conversation. I certainly, I don't know if anybody's going to listen to this, but I certainly enjoyed it. I will try to follow up and read uh, everything that was mentioned. Um, most <laughs> <laughs> don't kill yourself. <laughs> I mean, I'm an academic. It's reading is what I do anyway. So, uh, yeah. oh yeah, yeah. I was, I, I used to be in academia briefly and, uh, yeah. All of the, pretty much all the books and, and articles and stuff that were mentioned are available online. If you search for them, some of the more recently published books, um, you can get, at least at the time of recording, AK Press is having a sale that all, all their ebooks are one ninety nine uh, for those that are interested. Um, so yeah, well, thank you very much. I appreciate your giving me your time. Thank you very much for having me. And that's it for now. Thank you for tuning in and listening to this excellent conversation with Solar Punk Anarchist. I hope you got as much out of it as I did. Have a pleasant morning, afternoon, evening, whatever it is for you, and go join uh, the Industrial Workers of the World, Food Not Bombs, Black Rose Anarchist Federation, or any of a number of other excellent organizations, and put in the work to make this libertarian socialist future, this better world, really possible. Thank you.